Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander. And as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Fitz University in Johannesburg, South Africa. Very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, this has been the summer of the Chinese market crash, and everybody is asking the same question. Is the Chinese party in Africa actually coming to an end now? And what I mean by everybody, it's predominantly the international media, because all summer since we've seen, again, a rather stunning market turnaround in China, uh, the headlines have been really, for the most part, very, very bearish, kind of raising the question that if China sneezes, does Africa get a cold? Let's kind of step back a little bit and refresh you on some of the events that have led up to this. And we're going to talk today about the economic impact of China's market turmoil on Africa and whether or not the media narrative that we're seeing is actually reflective, reflective of the reality. So, Cobus, it all began back on June 12th of 2015 when a seven-year bull run uh, on the Chinese stock markets came to an end, and the markets since then have lost 39%, wiping away a total of $5 trillion in market value across all of the mainland stock markets. People will re- may remember uh, Black Monday, which was August 24th, the Shanghai Main Share Index lost 8.49%. Then on Tuesday, the following day, the market fell another 7%. And all of this really started to raise kind of the concerns that will the Chinese economic miracle of the past 30 years now finally be coming to an end? And what will the impact be for uh, people on the outside if Chinese consumers start to panic and not buy anymore? Now, to add to this type of kind of gloom and doom, the Caixin Media and Market Economics Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index for September fell to 47. Now, that number by itself doesn't really mean much, but when you consider the fact that that's the lowest level since 2008, that starts to raise concerns. Now, Beijing is is expected to report economic growth of about 6.5 to 7%. That's down from 7.3% last year, but more than double the 3.1% forecast for the U.S. by the International Monetary Fund in Washington. Only India, by the way, is expected to grow faster at 7.5%. However, there should be a little asterisk next to the Chinese growth numbers, or at least those forecasts, because a lot of experts really don't believe that the growth will be at anywhere near 7%. Because if you measure Chinese economic output, and you measure energy use and these other barometers of the economy, they're all pointing to maybe 1% to 2%, really bringing the, uh, the question of whether China will actually fall into recession in the next few years. So these growth numbers are highly highly suspect. Okay, Kobus, that is the gloom and doom. As with everything, there is a whole nother story. And this is a story that isn't talked about very much. Retail sales grew by 10.4% in August. Now, when we talk about sales, the economy is actually still growing. We talk about the stock market, only 7% of Chinese households actually own stocks. So the ripple effect of this 39% market plunge is actually not felt across the economy, unlike in the United States and in parts of Europe. The market as a whole from this year, September, as we record this uh, this podcast, the market year on year is up 33.82%. So listen, we've had a 39% plunge, but it's still up almost 33%, 34% in year over year, which just makes it really not a crash in that sense when you put it in the broader context. Now, let's talk about the RMB devaluation, because that also took Africa by surprise, particularly a lot of developing economies were very, very surprised when the Chinese central bank devalued the Chinese uh, renminbi, or the yuan, by uh, 4%. Now, that shook the markets quite a bit. African central banks, particularly in Nigeria, had to spend huge amounts of their reserves in order to prop up their own currencies. But let's take into account the RMB is up 25% against the dollar since 2005. So taken into a broader context, a 4% devaluation given measured against a 25% increase over the past 10 years, still pretty good. And again, we have to think about the growth overall, 10% since 2008 in the U.S., 66% in China. Kobus, that was a whole lot of statistics. I hope our audience (laughs) completely hasn't fallen asleep there. But I did want to paint two very distinct pictures here. There is a negative story, and it is a real story. There are a whole lot of reasons to be very concerned about what's going on in China. The flip side of it is that there are also a lot of reasons to kind of step back, take a breath, and recognize that, you know, the sky may not actually be falling. 
Yeah, I mean, one of one of the reasons why we, you know, when we did, we discussing, we were discussing this. Um, it, it struck us that as there was all this this doom and gloom talk about about the 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 fall in the Chinese economy and then particularly the impact on Africa's economy, we we kept seeing announcements of new infrastructure deals. So that that was quite kind of interesting. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of announcements of infrastructure, old infrastructure projects being being finalized. So you see those, and of course they you know kind of they date from from an earlier, more prosperous time. But there are new ones being announced. Um, you know, kind of so there are rail projects in Kenya. There's um, new rail projects in in Ethiopia. There's um, you know kind of uh, half a billion um, loan in to uh, the copper copper industry um, in Zambia. And you know, kind of so this this actually, it struck us that maybe the the impact on the, on Africa's economy is going to be slightly more complicated than predicted. Because on the one hand, you do see these new deals being announced. On the other hand, everyone agrees that this is going to be very bad for African commodity markets, and especially African mineral producers are going to are going to suffer a lot. So you have an interesting situation where, on the one hand, African countries are now not able to sell the minerals. Yet they still have continuing and new China debt to China um, coming out of big infrastructure deals that they have to to repay by selling minerals to China, who's not buying minerals. So you know, kind of, it, it seems like there is the the impact is going to happen different in different sectors in the African economy. Um, and, you know, kind of the, the, the impact of the Chinese downturn needs to be unpacked a little bit, I think. Well, let's take a look at some of the headlines that you're referring to. The Wall Street Journal, in Africa, those who bet on China face a fallout. The Financial Times wrote, China turbulence cast shadow on Africa. Reuters, is 2015 the beginning of the end for Africa's China-led boom? And I think one of the things that struck me, and I have to admit, it's the same thing that you and I are guilty of in this very podcast, is the fact that referring to Africa as a whole may, in fact, be the problem here. Because the impact, as you suggested, uh, it's going to be different in different countries. So in the past week, three specific countries have been identified as potentially being the hardest hit. Uh, South Africa, because of steel, and also the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. We'll get to that very quickly. Angola, because of the heavy dependence on uh, Afri- uh, of Angolan oil exports and the mountain of debt that they have. And Zambia, because of the copper that you talked about. Those three countries are standing out. But when we look at Ethiopia, even Kenya, and countries along the Maritime Silk Road, the impact is not expected to be as severe. So this brings up the question about how journalists are covering this question, and you know, particularly in the West, when they kind of lump all 54 countries together into a single entity, that may in fact be highly misleading. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, and I think I think one of the problems is that in the past, the you know, Western journalists haven't had the either the the personnel on the ground or the column inches to really create a, a body of knowledge about about the different kinds of economies happening in Africa with their readers. And now they don't have the kind of residual knowledge to, to fall back on when they need to explain these things. Um, so, yeah, you know, kind of you, you need to you need to ex- do a lot of basic explaining, um, I think, to, you know, kind of to, in, to explain why certain countries in Africa are going to be more impacted by this, this um, Chinese downturn than others. Um, and, you know, I think frequently there's both just not the space and the resources and the time and the will, I think, you know, kind of to, to really unpack that a lot in, in the mainstream Western media. Well, looking at the media coverage before we get back to the economics of it, I've noticed a very stark difference. And I'd like to get your take on this as a kind of Asia-Africa media scholar yourself, a stark difference in terms of the narratives kind of portrayed in the Western or the English language media or the non-African English language media, African media itself, which is the local reporting at the national level and even at the local level, and then the Chinese media. So not surprisingly, um, I've been reading the Chinese media quite a bit, and they are not, you know, they're hewing the party line. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Well, I think that's, you know, very, very dangerous in many respects because, you know, the, for the most part, the level of Chinese knowledge of the of the average news consumer on a lot of these topics is just absolutely abysmal, in part because of the very strict kind of propaganda and content regulations that exist. So the Chinese news consumer is generally ignorant about all of this, and their media coverage has just been like, problem? What problem? 
In Africa, it's been far more complicated. You and I kind of sit over Twitter and Facebook all day looking for articles. And again, what we've seen is deal after deal after deal being announced. I saw an article today talking really about how, excite, how excited Huawei is for expanding its market share, for wanting to overtake Samsung as the number one handset maker. So growth in the private sector, uh, you know, more development money coming. China's very much engaged. And they're focusing at the kind of 1,000-meter level, whereas the international press often focuses at the 30,000-meter level. We talked about this recently with Barry Van Wick of the China Africa Reporting Project, that oftentimes... The international media comes in with these big sweeping narratives, and a lot gets lost in that. I really feel that this henny penny, the sky is falling, the party's over, all of those kinds of negative narratives coming out of the Western media is, in some ways, there's a feeling of like a little bit of comeuppance, like, ha, Africa, you made your bed with China, now you got to sleep with it, there you go. And that just feels a little bit like what's going on because we're not seeing a more balanced approach such as what we've talked about earlier in terms of the positive economic numbers that are coming out of China, which is not all gloom and doom. What's your take on the differences between how Africans are covering this, how Chinese and in, in, in Asia, they, they're covering it, and also how it's being kind of consumed in the West? Um, you know, kind of, I, I completely agree. I think I think there is, in, in Western coverage, there is a little bit of schadenfreude happening. A kind of a feeling that, oh, now everything is kind of going to be normalized. You know, kind of the West is actually the best, the best leader for everyone in the world. China is actually a hidden basket case. Africa, you know, kind of should should, you know, kind of align itself back with with the West a bit closer. You know, kind of I mean that that might be overreading it a bit, but you know, you do you do find whiffs of that kind of kind of feeling around. Um I think in Africa the coverage is he was a little bit closer to the, in the first place, to the, to the particular kind of national economy, and then also to an important split between what's going to, what's, how is it going to impact growth rates and big industries, um, in particular, particular key industries in Africa, but then also how is it going to impact the um, African consumers? Because one of the impacts of the devaluation of, of the yuan is that consumer consumer goods from China are going to, are going to be cheaper. So there is a situation where where African economies might suffer, but African consumers might might actually, you know, kind of get cheaper goods. And it, it you know so so the, the the impacts on African societies are going to be more complex, I think, than than most Western narratives can admit or have space to to discuss. Um, And I think there's a lot more coverage of that in African press. Yeah. And again, it's going to vary, you know, dramatically across the continent. Let's take a look at a BBC story that was featured. And they went through the five ways the Chinese economy will affect Africa. And I'd like to get your take on this because it's very South Africa uh, heavy. First of all, they talk about the RAND. And I think the RAND is very interesting because the RAND seems to move very, very closely with whatever whatever economic news comes out of China. We've seen over the course of the summer the RAND hitting low after low after low, uh, and it's really been quite staggering. And so in some ways it highlights the integration of the South Africa economy and the Chinese economy. The point number two that they take, they take uh, at the BBC is the the JSE, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Uh, and they say that they're expecting that, uh, you know, there'll be sell-offs there as well as many mining stocks and natural resources stocks that are dependent on the African, on the Chinese market, uh, will be affected by that. So the RAND and the JSE, and I thought that was interesting how the BBC, you know, said five ways the Chinese economy will affect Africa, and two of those ways were focused exclusively on South Africa, which just yes. really was kind of interesting. Uh, number three, they said trade and investment. This is one where I don't think it's going to have that big of an impact. And in part, and I may be a contrarian here, but we've talked about this before. China, Chinese investment in Africa represents about 4.3, 4.5%. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Chinese trade represents by between 4.3, 4.4, somewhere in that range, uh, maybe up to 4.8% of China's overall global trade balance. So at the end of the day, uh, it's rather insignificant. Now, for each African country, China plays an incredibly important role, as many of now uh, have China as their largest trading partner. But for the most part, I don't see China just cutting off the spigot of trade and investment going into Africa, in part because the numbers are relatively small uh, when you compare China's investment in the Middle East, the Persian Gulf, the United States, and here in Asia. So in that sense, that too may be a little bit overblown. Number four, tourism. Tourism, I definitely see, will be a big impact. 
uh, you know, in Africa, that there will be fewer Chinese tourists as they don't have as much disposable income and as they become more concerned about the economy. Uh, so that would definitely have uh, some serious repercussions as Chinese tourism was considered to be the hot new growth market for a lot of uh, you know, national tourism industries. And then finally, the loans question. And this is the one where I want to get your take on this. Earlier this summer, Angola went to China and said, we have between 20 and $22 billion in Chinese loans, and we're getting crushed by them. Now Zambia is coming up and saying, we can't handle a lot of the loans that are, hap- that, that are weighing on us. And it's starting to raise the specter that 30 years after Africa emerged from the debt crisis that it had with the West, and a lot of debt forgiveness was done, restructuring with the West was done, and it kind of they had a clean slate there is a sense, this brooding sense that, uh uh-oh, here we are again now with the Chinese. And with the Chinese, it's even more complicated because, as you pointed out at the top of the show, on the one hand, Angola owes China enormous amounts of money. On the other hand, they depend on China to buy their oil. So the two are absolutely interlinked with one another, again, putting us back almost where we were with Africa in the West 30, 40 years ago. What, what's your take on both the BBC's kind of ranking of these different categories of how the Chinese economy will affect Africa, and particularly the loan question? Yeah, I have to say, and again, obviously, I'm not an economist, um, but I think I think you you laid out very well, and I think I think it's very worrying. The only thing I can, I can think, you know, is that it might lead Africa to to kind of restructure its own economy. Um, you know, kind of in. We we do see the development of um, of new centers of development, you know, kind of in Africa, um, the emergence of new centers of development, um, you know, kind of the the strip along the along east uh, the east coast of Africa um, around uh, around Nairobi, you know, kind of extending to its neighboring states, Nigeria on the other side. Um, the the issue is whether it will be possible. For, for 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 it seems to be one of the issues is, is that whether it will be possible for intra-African trade to pick up some of of the kind of the 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 slack you know kind of so as as Chinese demands for African commodities weaken whether it's possible for intra-African trade to take up some some of that you know so some of that slack um, I'm not super optimistic that it will no um, I don't think but, so either the volume just isn't there yeah. The volume isn't there, and also, you know, kind of so so much of of the of the growth that drove that drove the, the all of this infrastructure building and so on was was on the back of Chinese consumption of African commodities. Um, so it just it's this kind of circle logic where you know, kind of a snake eating its tail, basically, where you end up where you started. Um, I have to say that the specter of an, of Africa being indebted again, you know, kind of, and with with you know, kind of tons and tons of money just kind of flowing out as as interest payments on loans, is almost too depressing, depressing. to contemplate. You it know, is. kind of, it makes me want to like run to the hills. But, it's too but before we get to to blame the Chinese for all of this, and again, I'm I'm no defender of the Chinese. I know people accuse me of that, but I'm not. Um, I don't really have a horse in the race. Uh, I'm just kind of pointing out the fact that Ghana, who is also now kind of starting to be worried about its own debt, uh, a lot of that debt that the Ghanaians have isn't to the Chinese, but to the IMF and to to, to the West. So uh, yes. we're back. I mean, so China is a player in this debt problem. And in some countries, it's the primary player. But continent wide, um, it's not the only player. And I think that's also very important to keep the context here. Um, you know, let's kind of wrap this up a little bit and, and, and kind of give your your assessment of where you see this going in the short term, uh, you know, in terms of if the situation continues as it is now, which is highly uncertain, some good news, some bad news. How do you think African governments and particularly pick a couple countries will respond? Well, it seems to me that, that at the moment, African governments are kind of in a crouch, you know, and they um, they they're, they're kind of waiting to see how things will Will play out. I think before they before they make big commitments, um, there's been talk that you know there's been a lot of calls that Africa should widen its and diversify its connections with with other emerging investors. Um, so lots of calls for stronger relationships with with India, for example. Um, so I'm sure that some African governments would would pursue that um, and. You know, kind of at the same time, I think there's also what you know 
we'll also see maybe a, a kind of a realignment or a slight shift in the relationship with China. I mean, I, I think the, the first thing one, one or the, the last thing one should do is to, to think that the Africa-China relationship is going away. Um, you know, I, th- I think the China is going to be is going to continue to be very prominent in Africa, but it might be prominent in a different kind of way that we don't know yet how it will be de- how it will develop. Um, but you know, kind of what what you do see, we're running up to to the the forum on China Africa cooperation um, leaders summit um, in December, so that will be that will reveal a lot about where where we are exactly at the moment. But you, you there's still relentless cycle of African leaders, you know, visiting Beijing. There's still announcement of big deals. Um, so to a certain sense, you know, kind of a lot of what, what we what we saw over the last few years seem to be continuing. But, you know, some of it might be might be overstating by by press agencies. Some of it might die on the on the vine. Some of it might change shape. Yeah. So it's, it's so I think everyone is kind of waiting and seeing. I, I agree. I I don't think we're going to see a sudden change in the relationship. First of all, Africa, particularly Eastern Africa, plays a very important strategic role for China's global maritime strategy in the form of the One Belt, One Road. So this infrastructure development that's occurring uh, with the standard gauge railway in Kenya, the ports in Mombasa, the ports in Djibouti, uh, all the way up into the Suez Canal, I think that's going to go ahead and we're going to see big growth on that because that's part of a much grander global trade strategy that the Chinese have. Then we're going to see, you know, the relationship with South Africa, I think, will stay very, very strong as that we've discussed this in previous shows about the political integration, now the military cooperation, so many different levels that it's occurring on. Uh, North Africa is also a very hot space for, for Chinese investment, particularly in the oil and gas sector. So that will probably do well. The countries that I would be worried about are countries like Botswana which are landlocked, very resource poor, have not had the strategic value for China, they may get uh, the short end of the stick. And then China may retrench from those areas. It may also retrench from investments in the riskier areas like Sudan, South Sudan, and the DRC, where they go, you know what, this is a little bit too costly for us. It's too complicated. Um, I don't see the Chinese retrenching on the diplomatic front, particularly with the UN and its uh, security operations. That's probably going to increase in the the future. Um, So I'm not going to see a huge dramatic shift. Again, I still see Africa as a relatively small piece of China's bigger global trade pie and investment pie. So I think for the Chinese, they're not that intimidated by what's going, going on. Here in Southeast Asia, which has, you know, by a factor of maybe a hundred times the investment that the Chinese are doing in Africa, um, there's much less concern. Uh, There is, uh, you know, less concern. There is still some concern. But at the same time, they're seeing the Chinese still actively engaged in this part of the world economically. Uh, So so I'm going to kind of fall with you on the, you know, the sky is not falling. And I think that there's a lot of uh, overblown media coverage. Before we go, I'd like to recommend everybody to read two articles that are are just highly informative on this subject. Uh, Number one, Martin Jack, who is the author of When China Rules the World, he wrote a column on September 14th in The Guardian, uh, it's not the Chinese economy that's on life support. And he's very much in defense of the Chinese and kind of saying, you know what, everything's going to be fine. Now, for a contrarian point of view from that, Deborah Braudigan, a very well-known China-Africa scholar, she wrote a, an article on CNN.com, What Does China's Shock Yuan Devaluation Mean for Africa? And she really kind of goes through and says, it ain't good. So those are two perspectives that I think that everybody should, should kind of take a look at and will help inform this discussion. I'll post those in our show notes on our webpage at ChinaAfricaProject.com. Uh, we'd love to hear your comments about this. Kobus and I... We put together a web page that we have all of our stories so you can search back episodes. But, Kobus, we also kind of been following this story every single day for the past two or three months over on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash China Africa Project. And we're also we also updating this all the time um, on our Facebook page um, and on Twitter. So um, I'm at Stadnesk. As S T A D E N E S Q U E, and you can follow both of us on a, on a regular basis. You yeah. know, kind of updating all the time. Uh, if you'd like to follow this podcast, uh, go ahead and look over, look us up over on iTunes. Just uh, search for China Africa, and we're coming up right there. And by the way, iOS, our app is is fixed and it's up. We're having some problems with our Android app. We apologize. We're trying to fix it as fast as we can, and I'll let everybody know when that's ready. But if you want to listen to us also on SoundCloud and Stitcher, we're available there. 
We'll be back again very soon with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening. 